he betrayed the solicitude about the safety of the ship. Some of the seamen declared that it was only on account of his being a part owner in her. So when they were working that evening at the pumps, there was on this head no small gamesomeness slyly going on among them, as they stood with their feet continually overflowed by the rippling clear water, clear as any mountain spring, gentlemen, that bubbling from the pumps ran across the deck, and poured itself out in steady spouts at the lee scupper holes. Now, as you well know, it is not seldom the case in this conventional world of ours, watery or otherwise, that when a person placed in command over his fellow men finds one of them to be very significantly his superior in general pride of manhood, straightway against that man he conceives an unconquerable dislike and bitterness, and if he have a chance he will pull down and pulverize that subaltern's tower, and make a little heap of dust of it. Be this conceit of mine as it may, gentlemen, at all events Steel Kilt was a tall and noble animal with a head like a Roman, and a flowing golden beard like the tasseled housings of your last viceroy's snorting charger, and a brain, and a heart, and a soul in him, gentlemen, which had made Steel Kilt Charlemagne, had he been born son to Charlemagne's father. But Radney, the mate, was ugly as a mule, yet as hardy, as stubborn, as malicious. He did not love Steel Kilt, and Steel Kilt knew it. Espying the mate drawing near as he was toiling at the pump with the rest, the lakeman affected not to notice him, but unknown, went on with his gay banterings. Aye, 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 my merry lads, it's a lively leak this. Hold a canakin, one of ye, and let's have a taste. By the Lord, it's worth bottling. I tell ye what, men, old Rad's investment must go for it. He had best cut away his part of the hull and tow it home. The fact is, boys, that swordfish only began the job. He's come back again with the gang of ship carpenters, sawfish, and filefish, and what not, and the whole posse of them are now hard at work cutting and slashing at the bottom, making improvements, I suppose. If old Rad were here now, I'd tell him to jump overboard and scatter him. They're playing the devil with his estate, I can tell him. But he's a simple old soul. Rad, and a beauty too. Boys, they say the rest of his property is invested in looking glasses. I wonder if he'd give a poor devil like me the model of his nose. Damn your eyes. What's that pump stopping for? Roared Radney, pretending not to have heard the sailors talk. Thunder away at it. Aye, 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 sir, said Steel Kilt, merry as a cricket. Lively, boys, lively, now. And with that the pump clanged like fifty fire engines. The men tossed their hats off to it, and ere long that peculiar gasping of the lungs was heard which denotes the fullest tension of life's utmost energies. Quitting the pump at last, with the rest of his band, the lakeman went forward all panting and sat himself down on the windlass, his face fiery red, his eyes bloodshot, and wiping the profuse sweat from his brow. Now what cousining fiend it was, gentlemen, that possessed Radney to meddle with such a man in that corporeally exasperated state, I know not, but so it happened. Intolerably striding along the deck, the mate commanded him to get a broom and sweep down the planks, and also a shovel, and remove some offensive matters consequent upon allowing a pig to run at large. Now, gentlemen, sweeping a ship's deck at sea is a piece of household work which in all times but raging gales is regularly attended to every evening. It has been known to be done in the case of ships actually foundering at the time. Such, gentlemen, is the inflexibility of sea usages and the instinctive love of neatness in seamen, some of whom would not willingly drown without first washing their faces. But in all vessels this broom business is the prescriptive province of the boys, if boys there be aboard. Besides, it was the stronger men in the town ho that had been divided into gangs, taking turns at the pumps and being the most athletic seaman of them all, Steel Kilt had been regularly assigned captain of one of the gangs, consequently he should have been freed from any trivial business not connected with truly nautical duties, such being the case with his comrades.
I mention all these particulars so that you may understand exactly how this affair stood between the two men. But there was more than this, the order about the shovel was almost as plainly meant to sting and insult steel kilt, as though Rodney had spat in his face. Any man who has gone sailor in a whale ship will understand this, and all this and doubtless much more, the lakeman fully comprehended when the mate uttered his command. But as he sat still for a moment, and as he steadfastly looked into the mate's malignant eye and perceived the stacks of powder casks heaped up in him and the slow match silently burning along towards them, as he instinctively saw all this, that strange forbearance and unwillingness to stir up the deeper passionateness in any already ireful being, a repugnance most felt, when felt at all, by really valiant men even when aggrieved. This nameless phantom feeling, gentlemen, stole over steel kilt. Therefore, in his ordinary tone, only a little broken by the bodily exhaustion he was temporarily in, he answered him saying that sweeping the deck was not his business, and he would not do it. And then, without at all alluding to the shovel, he pointed to three lads as the customary sweepers, who, not being billeted at the pumps, had done little or nothing all day. To this, Radney replied with an oath, in a most domineering and outrageous manner, unconditionally reiterating his command, meanwhile advancing upon the still-seated legman, with an uplifted Cooper's club hammer which he had snatched from a cask nearby. Heated and irritated as he was by his spasmodic toil at the pumps, for all his first nameless feeling of forbearance the sweating steel kilt could but ill brook this bearing in the mate, but somehow still smothering the conflagration within him, without speaking he remained doggedly rooted to his seat, till at last the incensed Radney shook the hammer within a few inches of his face, furiously commanding him to do his bidding. Steel kilt rose and slowly retreating round the windlass, steadily followed by the mate with his menacing hammer, deliberately repeated his intention not to obey. Seeing, however, that his forbearance had not the slightest effect, by an awful and unspeakable intimation with his twisted hand he warned off the foolish and infatuated man, but it was to no purpose. And in this way the two went once slowly round the windlass, when, Resolved at last no longer to retreat, bethinking him that he had now forborne as much as comported with his humor, the lakeman paused on the hatches and thus spoke to the officer. Mr. Radney, I will not obey you. Take that hammer away, or look to yourself. But the predestinated mate coming still closer to him, where the lakeman stood fixed, now shook the heavy hammer within an inch of his teeth, meanwhile repeating a string of insufferable maledictions, retreating not the thousandth part of an inch, stabbing him in the eye with the unflinching poniard of his glance, steel kilt, clenching his right hand behind him and creepingly drawing it back, told his persecutor that if the hammer but grazed his cheek he, steel kilt, would murder him. But, gentlemen, the fool had been branded for the slaughter by the gods. Immediately the hammer touched the cheek. The next instant the lower jaw of the mate was stove in his head. He fell on the hatch spouting blood like a whale. Ere the cry could go aft still Kilt was shaking one of the backstays leading far aloft to where two of his comrades were standing their mastheads. They were both canallers. Canallers! cried Don Pedro. We have seen many whale ships in our harbors, but never heard of your canellers. Pardon, who and what are they? Canellers, Don, are the boatmen belonging to our Grand Erie Canal. You must have heard of it. Nay, senor, hereabouts in this dull, warm, most lazy, and hereditary land, we know but little of your vigorous north. I? Well then, Don. Refill my cup. Your sheik has very fine, and ere proceeding further I will tell you what our canellers are, for such information may throw side light upon my story. For three hundred and sixty miles, gentlemen, through the entire breadth of the state of New York, through numerous populous cities and 